So how does research come to influence policy? Well, it doesn't start out with that as an aim. Um, people like me work in evidence reviews with organisations like What Works for Wellbeing, which is a government initiative to examine the evidence around a whole load of um, interventions around culture and sport. You know, we collate all that evidence and we advise policymakers on what works for whom in what circumstances. I know my colleague here done a lot of systematic reviewing, so it's kind of that's kind of one end of this work, which is quite important to do. Um, but the research doesn't set out to influence policy. The research sets out to answer questions that arise in con particular contexts. So I think if we set out with a research network with a view of influencing policy, we've kind of put the cart before the horse a little bit. Um, we need to do the research because the research is important and because we want answers to questions. And then policymakers, we hope, uh, can be well informed enough to be able to understand and we might have to help them understand that evidence base. Um, but it's really important to separate the advocacy because the advocacy is still important. So groups like the All Party Parliamentary uh, Inquiry on Arts, Health and Wellbeing that I was an advisor to um, it's very clearly an advocacy body, it was never a research body. Um, it was always been intended to bring the evidence together and try and understand the best evidence and bring it to the, intent, bring it to the attention of policymakers. Um, but they're not necessarily a research body, so I think we, it's really important to understand the difference between research and advocacy and how the two fit together in the kind of cycle. I think there's another need that's really important and that is about supporting practitioners because a lot of people who work in this field work with very small projects, very small budgets, they don't necessarily have training budgets. There aren't established pathways for training in this work. If you want to be a professional artist, there are sort of training pathways. If you want to be an arts therapist, there are kind of established pathways. Um, there are some really great barriers to accessing those and they're not for everyone and it doesn't reflect the full breadth of this work. You don't always need to be an art therapist in order to deliver this work as we've seen. So what are the pathways and how do you get the knowledge, the support, the skill, um, the reinforcement and how and a lot of my work really has been around working with practitioners to understand the landscape of opportunities, understand how the health budgets work, how commissioning works how different organisations work, and to understand the kind of language and a bit of sort of knowledge translation between health, social care and arts. And it's much easier to do that when you've got health and social care around the table with you. That's what seems to be one of the biggest challenges that we have, because a lot of this impetus comes from the arts, um, whereas really we'd like to see more of it coming from health. So there's an interesting conundrum, which is a research question in its own right. Um, so, uh, the other need that I think is important, which they're all linked but it's slightly separate, is around training and best practice development. So how do we define best practice in this field? Where would we recognise poor practice? Many of you would, but is that codified in any way? Is there any support for infrastructure organisations that can help to move that piece of work on? So, uh, organisations that can offer training, um, have discussions about kind of what level of regulation might be needed, how do we share knowledge and best practice. And so I suppose maybe a starting point for um, a kind of research network might be a kind of mapping exercise where you map out these different needs and think about the different methodologies, approaches, and partnerships that are needed for each one um, mm -hmm. and just get some clarity around the, the kind of bigger picture. <coughs> I did want to say a little bit about kind of um, research as a topic because research in arts, health and wellbeing is a massive topic um, and it's because it's very multidisciplinary you've got people using very different languages so sometimes they might use the same words but they mean quite different things uh, and if, you, if you're in an environment and you're trying to um, advocate or gain kind of credibility for something and you're using the language in the wrong way or you don't kind of understand the language, it can be really difficult. And so the way artists might describe their interventions would be really different to how health commissioners might 
describe them. So if a health commissioner is sitting there and they've got a choice between a dance project here and a gardening project here, and they're neither a dancer nor a gardener, how are they going to know how to compare the two? So there's something about, you know, this language is needed on both sides. Uh, and I think sometimes when we talk about research, we often assume that we're talking about clinical research, mm -hmm. so big studies that are going to influence policy, that are going to lead to changes in practice, that are going to be kind of international. And a lot of my work is involved in reviewing those kinds of studies, and unfortunately, um, we're constantly having to say that we haven't found strong evidence for X and we haven't found strong evidence mm -hmm. for Y. And it's not because the thing doesn't work, it's often because the studies just haven't been done, or they haven't been done at scale, or they've been using the wrong maybe intervention measures or outcome measures, so there's some work that needs to be done before you get to that stage. I would put in an argument for RCTs and that kind of evidence-based healthcare approach. I do think it's very important. If I go to my GP and I need some, you know, quite hefty sort of surgical or medical intervention, I really want to know that that's been tested in a randomised trial because that is the best methodology for testing that kind of intervention. And I don't want my doctor to say, oh, well, I'll just consult my intuition um, at that point. You know, there are time, there's time and place <laughs> for that. But, um, and also there's another argument that those interventions, if they do deliver clinical benefits, they should be replicable. So we should be able to take this intervention and repeat it, because that's also an equity issue. So successful interventions should be available to everyone. So if we're not able to replicate them, and if we're not able to um, migrate them into different contexts, then it's a bit of a postcode lottery about who gets some of these interventions. So we need that science base, uh, but we need it at the right time. And I'd say that this sort of research, if it's done too early, is really counterproductive, mm -hmm. because then you get people like me saying, well, no, we haven't got the evidence, and then people will dismiss that and say, well, we did that study on uh, music and schizophrenia, and it was shown it not to work. And then 20 years later, you know, people are still saying, well, it doesn't work. So you have to understand the, the staged approach, I suppose, of evidence-based healthcare, and understand where we are at in terms of understanding our study populations, our interventions, our control measures and our outcomes. So describing the practice is the very first step and a lot of practice is very, very under-described. So when I wrote the Public Health England Arts and Health Evaluation Framework, um, the point of that wasn't to impose a standard framework on everyone to do the same methodology because that's really not the thing that's needed. But there is a standard reporting tool, so we're all describing our interventions in the same way. So questions like the duration of the intervention, the mode of delivery, the kind of resources you need to deliver it, who delivers it, does it need to be a professional artist, could it be a volunteer, does it need to be an art therapist, um, and this is all very, very unclear. So when you look at the international evidence, or something like, say, music therapy and dementia, what you'll find is that music therapy is defined in so many different ways that it has no real meaning um, that's kind of internationally recognised. So here we talk about art therapies in terms of the language of the Health Professions Council, there's registered professions with protected titles, but that's not how it's described in the international literature. Mm -hmm. So what you'll get is people doing an intervention and calling it art therapy, but it might not be what we would see as art therapy. And also you'll get instances of art therapists delivering interventions which are actually arts and health interventions. They just happen to be art therapists delivering it. So there's a lot of fluidity here, um, but I think just being clear and defining the practice is a really important step before we start going down the road of outcomes research when we haven't really understood what outcomes might be. Um, so I would say yes, more research is needed, but I would also say there are some caveats to that. So the first caveat is, what level of evidence do we really need to demonstrate that arts activities in care homes are of benefit? Mm. So do we really need this high level kind of drugs trial evidence in order to show you know, surely it's more important that we have, if we're arguing that that should be a role like for everyone, then fair enough, but you will get small scale 
low-key activities and unique contexts, um, you know, which need good evaluation, so they can be replicated and it can be uh, populated elsewhere, but not necessarily these high-level research studies with huge budgets, which often end up coming in below par because they just aren't at the scale that's needed. So I think it's best to be more, more modest in our research aims for those sorts of things. The emphasis for me is on local partnerships, and again, some of the work started by David Walters was really starting to go down that road, so it would be good to see that continue. And then, also as a social scientist, I would say that clinical research questions are the only research questions. So we have other questions that we need answering. So some of the questions around how do we develop the practice? How do we engage with the partners? Um, what's the role of health humanities within this kind of landscape? Um, what methodologies to understand these sorts of questions? So these aren't clinical questions. These are policy, organisational, social research questions. So we need multidisciplinary teams. We need to not forget the social sciences within that. Uh, and the most recent work I've done has been around social movement theory. So it's not trying to understand how arts and health can be effective. The question really is how does arts and health understand itself as a movement? How does it succeed in changing policy agendas? How does it successfully advocate? Um, and I think it's really interesting to understand how social movements work in order to understand how we can move this field forward. So again, not a clinical research question, but a really important research question to understand how social movements, successful social movements. So if we think about social movements like the women's health movement, HIV and AIDS, all those movements that have actually managed to influence policy over the years, and they haven't done it through randomised trials and science. They have to a degree. That's all been really part of the, um, if you like, the, the tools. But they've also done it through tactics, through um, different kind of engagement with power holders, with constituencies, really trying to um, address problems, trying to get a shared kind of understanding across boundaries. So a lot of boundary work happening. And artists in healthcare are real boundary workers, I think, uh, in the sense that they take boundary objects like music or like dance, which are understood very differently, and they take it into a context where people can develop a shared meaning around something that isn't normally in that environment. And it's that process of meaning making that's really important to understand. That's where people shift and change their perspectives. That's where things start to become more equal in terms of partnership working. That's something that brings about the change. So it's not a clinical intervention. It's an understanding of boundary work and boundary process. And that is something that um, requires a kind of social science understanding or similar um, so sometimes I think we, really neglect, really, we neglect those discipline areas that can really help us understand what's going on. So that would be my, um, that's my provocation. So just to sum up, I think we don't need just a research network. I think we need to understand what the different needs are that a network might, need, might meet, how research fits into that, what kind of research, what level of research, what's the role of local practice and local partnerships within that. And how can we broaden our research questions to understand how we can really benefit our movements? Actually, it's more powerful than you think because it's unlike any other area that we've seen policy. 
I, I would totally agree with that, and I think that, you know, from what I've observed about how policymakers do operate, actually they're often very uh, convinced by participant stories. And I think the way this work often works, and it is a conundrum, is that quite often, like I've been asking quite big research council uh, and youth bodies recently, and they're kind of bringing in arts perspectives all the time, and often the reason they're doing it is because it's to do with patient and public involvement, it's to do with participant voice. And my challenge would be to move that further around the research cycle so that it's not just there to enhance or embellish or communicate, uh, but it, there's a genuine process of sharing so that the, that patient voice or participant voice is actually involved in knowledge production and not just there to kind of mm -hmm. convince funders that you're doing your PPI. Um, so, I was always um, sharing it on the other side, but uh, just to go on from um, Jensen here, um, so how, what do you think of um, the role of practice as research as a kind of new area which could take just the voice, that next step where you're talking about looking at those ways in which we can formulate um, practice or knowledge through practice? I think that's a really important avenue, and I think it's one of the questions that needs to be... So we need to somehow acknowledge the importance of the clinical research, but also take it back where we need to research other things using other methodologies and understanding what's important. Um, so it is, it's all about kind of multiple approaches, isn't it? Working mm -hmm. side by side and understanding... But being clear, I think, and delineating and giving some more definition so that people who aren't involved in practice research can understand what it is mm -hmm. and have it explained to them in a way that's not sort of mysterious, just in the way that RCTs can seem <coughs> mysterious to people that come from the practice research. So it's all about kind of sharing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, just a couple of things. One, the UKRI AHRC recently opened a call around lived experience and valuing the lived experience voice. And 30% of funding had to go to people with lived experience. What I find the challenge is, is that universities aren't, uh, are so overwhelmed and understaffed that they can't actually even cost these calls. So often, if, you, if you're pushing a call through, they don't even get costed because they get shut down before they're even costed. There's something around the actual you know, the capacity within universities to actually put these bids through and actually enable it to happen. Secondly, um, five years ago, uh, I, we had a large welcome research grant to look at the outcomes of stroke policies um, and see whether it could be upscaled. It was Shaper, and it's the largest arts and health research impact award granted. And Welcome wouldn't accept participatory action research. And because I knew it was so important, we funded it out of our project grant because the health sciences were still very opposed to participatory action research. The outcome of the participatory action research is that the ambassadors are now have so much confidence they, that we've devolved leadership of that network to them. And they've set up as a disabled-led research network because participatory action research drives change from the grassroots up. Now, interestingly, five years later, it's well talked about and really, really, really popular. And AHRC and UKRA actively encourage it. And what participatory action research does is it basically co-produces research. So with a network of people with lived experience, clinicians, researchers, and healthcare workers, you start a question and it's iterative. So as the process goes on, you iterate the actual question by action research and the participants drive the research themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels exactly the right way to go. Because it, 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 it means that research isn't done to people, but with people, so that the participant's voice grows in confidence and then the advocacy happens, because they become confident enough to advocate to policy through the research processes they understand. I think this is where kind of social movement 
the concern because we've got something there which is about, I mean, I don't think it's like one methodology versus another methodology mm -hmm. because participant, um, participatory research can actually embrace any methodology. So if you've got a group of people who are living near an uh, electric thing or something that they think is harming the environment and they decide they want to commission a scientific study to investigate that, it's still participatory action research. Mm. So there isn't one methodology that's good and all the rest are sort of out of bounds. Mm. It's about who controls the research process. Yeah. And so that's about power. Um, and I think that's where social movement theory comes yeah. in. So some of these methodologies are starting to open up conversations mm. about power. But it is, going back to your earlier point, it's very difficult. It seems to be more and more difficult in universities to because funding seems to be getting harder and harder kind of access, especially for smaller projects. There's a lot more emphasis on big consortia kind of bids, which can work quite well for smaller universities, actually, because you can then bring something unique to the table if you can find the right partners. Because not everyone has got the, the research funding to be able to invest in the, the bidding process, which, as you say, is very costly and sometimes doesn't end up with the, a definite I think there's not enough risk taking at the university culture to enable these things to be called. I don't know, but you probably know that. Great. Anyone else? I'm sure we have themes all across, ideas all across. Thank you again, very much. So I heard my name. No, no, that's right. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, there's warm air coming yeah. through there. Nice. Warm air. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Seymour. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces and people that I haven't seen for quite a long time. <laughs> and uh, to um, just introduce you, I am not research. I am not university. <laughs> I am practice. Okay. So. Um, I um, was a dancer, or still am a dancer in my own privacy or at a party or wherever, but I don't tend to do um, serious, what I call serious dancing anymore. Um, but uh, I am a project manager and a creative producer now. Um, and it started for me really um, when I started working at Salisbury Hospital in 2013 um, with a very small project um, that was taking arts and dance and music onto the wards and I remember to this day the very moment that I stepped on the ward and everyone just looked at me and I was like you're going to do what and still every now and then that still happens but not very often now normally the response we get and that I would say six or seven years later we're now ten years later but it probably started to be a positive response about six or seven years into it mm -hmm. so then people started to ask for it, rather than look at us going, what on earth are you doing? So the clinical response has changed hugely over 10 years. So I'm just going to tell you about Art Care, which is at Salisbury Hospital. It's a department that's been running for 25 years. I joined it 10 years ago, so imagine it was going 15 years before I even joined. And the team at Art Care, I would say, have the most amazing model that is some of it's replicated around the country, but it is a real pinnacle of what we now call creative health um, in hospital mm -hmm. around the country. So I have that, my colleagues in art care to thank for that. And I've come into this amazing programme and run a section of it, which I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so we were given an Arts Council grant in 2013 to develop a project called Elevate, which is the programme that's still running today. And it's taking over the world. Um, but it, it's um, a three-year project, was funded by the Arts Council, to start 
a multi-arts programme within the hospital and just Salisbury Hospital. So we were working on about six or seven wards. I was the dance artist, there were several musicians, there was a poet, there was a storyteller and there was a writer. And we started working. Now I used to go into the day room of some of those um, wards. Those day rooms just got taken over by physiotherapy's kit basically, and all the lovely little group work that I used to do 10 years ago just sort of gradually shrunk until one day the staff said, we haven't got time to bring our patients to you anymore because I'd be sitting there with two people and thinking we're squashed into a cupboard and there's only two people here. And they would then say to me, could you come onto the wards? I.e. we haven't got time to bring people to you, but if you came to us, then we could get on with our work, but yep. you could be working with the patients. And Louise is nodding because she's part of that team that then started to go on the wards a few years later. But so we did. And I took my portable stereo onto the wards and people used to just look at me going, what on earth is this woman doing? But as we say, gradually the staff and the nursing staff, which we call sort of, you know, key people, the cleaners are the key people in the hospital because they know everybody. And they mm -hmm. came up to me and would say things like, Mr. So-and-so in bed three, he definitely needs you. Because they've had those <laughs> lovely chats with them. They know the people. The people, the grassroots, they know who, they, who needs us. The, the staff think they know who needs us, but they're probably going to signpost you to people who, yeah, they're arty, they need you, but they don't understand what we do in terms of who actually needs us rather than who would like us. So there's two different things there. So eventually, it started to be, yes, actually, at 10 o'clock on a Thursday, we have this session, and the staff start to go, oh, yeah, we can look forward to that, because all that dementia bay in what, what, you know, bay three are going to be occupied and really happy for an hour. And then they start peeking around the corner, watching, well, what's this magic that these dance artists are, are sort of creating in this ward? that keeps everybody really happy. Nobody presses their buzzer for an hour. Nobody shouts out, nurse, for an hour. And afterwards, the mood seems to be really positive. And people are singing, they're dancing, they're talking to each other, let alone staying in their beds like this. And so that sort of infiltrates into all sorts of different areas of the hospital. Even the doctors look up from their trolleys and go, oh my goodness, what's happening? So those were the really early beginnings. The musicians felt the same. They would come in as individuals. And also, the talking point was often the actual instrument. I can remember Seku Keita coming into our hospital with a kora, um, a West African beautiful harp with a gourd and all these strings, this beautiful thing. And he would come in with it carrying up to here in a case, and he looked like a sort of tortoise <laughs> and up and down, and the, the top was so big. But everybody, you know, a, a ward full of 80-year-olds, no one had ever even seen a Cora before. Yeah. So that was a starting point of conversation before they'd even got the instrument out. Then they start playing, and the most sublime music comes out, and particularly with families who have people that are perhaps towards the end of life, suddenly this music starts to mean something completely different. And the musician themselves, and Louisa, you know, you've worked with people, and obviously we said you've worked with people who are at the end of their lives, and you take away, as an artist and a practitioner, as much as the person or the people that you're working with. So that was the beginnings of Elevate, and it just started to develop. And in those three years of funding with the Arts Council, we partnered with Winchester University and a lovely woman called Costanza, I don't know if any of you remember Costanza, she came to observe and to analyse what we were doing and created a really fantastic document of evaluation. I can remember her trying to be as subtle as possible and standing watching things happening on the ward and keeping quiet. And at the end of one observation session, the nursing staff came up to me and said, who is she? And I said, oh, she's just evaluating Ella. Oh, thank God for that. We thought she was a hand sanitising um, control inspector. <laughs> <laughs> so she was being subtle, but uh, perhaps not subtle enough. You know, <laughs> So Costanza wrote this fantastic report, which we then took to, because we were going to run out of funding and we didn't have an option. After three years, we didn't really know what to do. And we took this report um, to our trustees, to the Salisbury Hospital trustees, and the STARS appeal, which is the, the trust 
um, uh, the charity that, that is run by the charitable trustees at Salisbury Hospital, they decided to fund us. And I'm not kidding you, it was on the back of that report. Absolutely 100%. They'd all read it from cover to cover. They quizzed me over it and we got funding. And they awarded us 45,000 for the year. Mm. They've never stopped funding us. And that was in 2016. And now we're in 2023 and we get 50,000 a year for Salisbury. That funds me for 12 hours a week. Uh, and obviously I'm extremely expensive. No. <laughs> um, but, and then that also funds three days a week of artists that deliver. So we have an artist on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday. So that, when I say artist, that could be, and I've just written them all down so that I can think about it, that could be a musician of all types. We have several harpists, guitarists, violin, flute, singers of all different genres. Um, what else do we have? Um, a cellist that, that loops, you know, when you, you, you play something and then you tap a, a, a pedal and then she accompanies herself, yeah, and so on. So we have a really lovely range of musicians. We have three different types of theatre makers um, and obviously their practice is very different when they go into a hospital from if they were making work mm. outside the hospital and they're always working on their own nearly because that's the funding as well. I must admit when I watched the video that you showed earlier on and there were was it three dancers and two musicians <laughs> to one child, <sighs> that's expensive, mm. <laughs> I've never been able to manage that so I don't know where they got their funding from. Um, <laughs> Um, we also have um, two poets uh, slash writers um, who work, um, and uh, we have a, one because Louise doesn't work us anymore so much, but dance movement um, artist, and she also runs an off-grid um, place that she lives. So there's a lot of nature that comes in there as well. Mm. Um, we also have three gardeners now um, because we run the program in other smaller hospitals. And nature, the outdoors, bringing the outdoors in, understanding and feeling, particularly when we're working with older patients, trying to get them outside, even though they're stuck inside, mm -hmm. is so important. And we've developed a strand of the whole program that's about nature. So in the smaller hospitals, when they've got these lovely little courtyard gardens, mm -hmm. we encourage the, the patients to go outside, pot things with compost and grow stuff and decorate the gardens. But when it's winter, the, the garden artists bring stuff with them and create things um, and, and very tactile sense and, and, and all those sensory um, feelings and things that they do. Um, when I always make a plan, I never stick to it. So uh, I'm just looking to see what else I wanted to say because I wrote some things down while Norma was talking as well. Um, oh yes, and we also partner with an organisation in Bournemouth because one of the hospitals we go to is Wimborne. And that's a long way actually from quite a lot of our artists. Um, when, oh, we have a saxophone player who plays outside most of the time and he's from Eastleigh. So you imagine Wimborne is like, you know, two hours drive. Mm -hmm. So I looked up um, uh, a couple of artists in Bournemouth and found Co-Create, which is a really lovely organisation that does mm -hmm. arts and health work, and had a meeting with them, visited them, looked at what they did, and they know, now run one-to-one -one sessions in Wimborne every week for us. So we've sort of contracted Co-Create, and there's three artists that share that, and we do a, a service agreement with them every year to uh, deliver once a week in those hospitals. But they've now been sort of connected with the other artists, Mm -hmm. Which brings me on to say that at least once a year, we bring all our artists together for training and development. And the most important thing about that is the food and the social and everything that goes with that, because they work on their own all the time. And so many people, and I'm sure that you're nodding, that you recognise that when you work on your own, you don't get to share that practice yeah. and, and understand what everybody else is doing. So this network, I would say, what's the most important things and what, you know, is, is coming together and sharing practice, which I know, unfortunately, I was working at the hospital this morning, but I've heard from people how lovely it is. You know, people like Sandy, who work a lot on their own, saying how lovely it was this morning to be moving with everybody else and, and working and, and reaffirming that you're doing the right thing when you come back together with people. So um, training and best practice, we have a, a sort of strand of the work that we do that um, we, we deliver for all our artists. And I think that also comes from the fact that I don't think I'm a natural project manager, I'm a natural artist. 
So I sort of think about the artists all the time. And sometimes I probably make the wrong decisions as a manager because I'm thinking about the artists too much. And one of those times was in COVID because COVID, as you can imagine, working in hospitals, stopped. But we didn't stop because I was so worried about those artists that weren't going to get paid. And we got the funding there. So we found ways of working online. I mean, Debbie, you recorded some dance sessions, didn't you, that we then broadcast. Um, but we, with as many artists as we could, we did things outside. And I've had musicians playing in like minus three outside windows in the hospital, but people were waving through the windows, <laughs> holding up signs saying, can you play this, you know? And even people dropping money from level four, which is dangerous. So <laughs> throwing us down and go But we kept it going and we convinced the Stars Appeal that we were doing the right thing, even though they did want to stop our funding mm -hmm. for that period of time. But I'm so glad that we did it because we learned so much about how else and alternatives ways of working from doing that. And we reached staff that we never knew we weren't reaching. The office staff, their morale, as you can imagine, for everybody was so low. But suddenly a musician was playing outside their window and they'd stop work for a bit. And we used to get these lovely emails going, oh, I was so stressed this morning. And suddenly this lovely music came through. And, la, la, la. and so we just thought, gosh, we we're reaching the staff as much as we're reaching the patients. Because we knew that about the nursing and the doctors, but not the admin staff. And there's mm -hmm. thousands of admin staff at the hospital. So it, it reached the staff. And that's the other part of the model that art care has, is that as well as the patients, it's as much well-being importance for the staff as the, the, the patients. So the programme delivers for them as well. Um, I think that's probably all that I want to say. Oh, just to refer, I totally uh, um, accept the patient voice situation. We write a, a closed blog that the artists report back on every time they've done a session. And we draw a lot of information from the patient um, uh, experience. And, you know, I have a, a, a folder full of the most amazing patient experience and patient voice response and feedback. And we have a referral system from staff, uh, clinical staff, that contact us and say, could you come and visit a patient in such and such a bed this week? And so our one-to-one -one artists or our musicians or whoever um, are part of their programme. We have, obviously, um, programmed in sessions but they have loose time, which they can then go to specific referrals. Uh, and sometimes we see people who are, are in the hospital for six or eight months, and they get to know everybody um, because they're referred on and on and on to us. And that's, I think I'll probably just finish that. I've brought lots of bits and pieces of, of paper that I can sort of spread around the tables and you can look at some of the work that we do and the advocacy, as it were. But uh, I just thought I'd finish with, um, we have this, because the Stars Appeal, told us that if they were going to fund us continually, we weren't allowed to call ourselves Elevate anymore. And I fought for it for two years, and then they said, we're not going to fund you anymore if you don't change your name. So we now called the Stars Appeal Live. But uh, the, they did say that the musicians and the artists could choose the name. So we came up with a long list of things, and we just thought Stars Appeal Live is quite snappy, because at least it's not Stars Appeal Dead. So, <laughs> um, but what we've done is we've taken photographs of all the artists. In fact, we've got new artists now, so this is a little bit out of date, but we have to do another update. Um, but we, it just says on the back, uh, we managed to wheedle the way that it didn't say, you were visited today and helped by the Stars Appeal, so that it didn't just have Stars Appeal, but we managed to say you're helped by the Stars Appeal through the artists. Mm -hmm. And people who have been in hospital a long time can also play staff bingo because if they've seen everybody, they can cross them up. No. But it's a really few of the real identity thing. So the staff will say, oh, Stephanie will visit you. Oh, I know Stephanie. There she is. I've seen her. So there's a conversation point immediately there. So you know I'm being flippant, but I'm also being serious as well because there's humour in everything. And yeah. there's humour in, in, you know, we're, we're, we're looking after people who are often extremely poorly and in the last few weeks of their lives. So if you can't bring humour and creativity to those sort of people, and that's the, the work that we're all doing, and, and that's what I hope that we can support this network with as well. And um, when I spoke to my art care colleagues, they said that we can certainly offer placements and support for people who want to go further into their movement and health or the arts and health network because we're only in Salisbury we're over the border 
of Hampshire and Wiltshire, but we're really close, so yeah, mm -hmm. we're very happy to support the network. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm just standing so then I can see everybody. It's, yeah. Um, so yes, I'm Louisa White and 10 years ago, actually probably 11 years ago, I set up um, a very small arts organisation called the Joyful Jams. And we registered as a, as a CIC, as a SIC. Um, and the emphasis of the um, of Jams, so it stands for a Joyful Arts Movement and Song. So basically the, um, the aim for me was to bring creative arts intervention into care homes because there was a real, uh, a real gap in provision. So, you know, I really felt that and wanted to, yeah, just to do something about that. And I think I felt very drawn to working with people living with dementia. Um, it enabled me within my practice to, to work very intuitively and very instinctively and also quite, well, authentically. And one of the things that I love about working with people with dementia is that they really, um, they demanded of me to really sense into how I was feeling at that time. Um, you know, what, yeah, and what, what I felt was needed in, in that moment. And I know as artists working in the field, you know, that's, that's how we, we respond. But, for me, there was something very strong working with people with dementia and how that, how that enabled me to step more into that. So, yeah, my project, my, my work continues to evolve. Um, so in the films that you saw, um, I use a lot of props in my work. Um, so a giant scrunchie that really supports to bring people together, um, silk scarves and long feathers, and all of these things are, are tools to help people that perhaps aren't so engaged with movement to bring them out a little, you know, of, of themselves and in some ways, you know, do act as, as a distraction. Um, but also then, you know, once we have um, initiated the movement, how then we're able to keep that movement going so that then it doesn't rely solely on, on the props. So for me, as my, my practice is moving forward, I'm also you know, constantly looking for my practice reflecting where I'm going. So how that is then to be moving a lot more without the aid of all the big elastics and, you know, these other things. So, so yeah, Jams has been running for 11 years. Um, we've had the bigger projects which were funded by Arts Council England. So the film work that you saw and then we did a performance piece in the, in the care home gardens. And that was all lovely, it really, really went well. And we had the booklet as well, and I have got a copy of it. Um, so I'll just, in case anybody was interested, I'll just leave it out. Um, so I may have, yeah, I mentioned earlier that um, the Arts as Wellbeing Trust, which was started here, um, is now potentially up and running again. So. Myself and June Boy Boyce Tillman and some other dance colleagues, um, you know, are, are hoping to breathe some life back into that. So my hope is that Jams will come under that umbrella. So then through that, the work that Jams does, it's not just about people living with dementia. For my next project, you know, I really hope to be working with young carers and with refugees. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, it's about placing these things that I feel work, that we know work, mm -hmm. into, other, into other areas. Yeah. Thank you. 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 So uh, my name is Amanda Watkinson. Um, and I run a dance charity based here in Winchester. Um, it's, um, it's still, I'd still say it's very much in its infancy. So I, uh, it started out as a sort of community project that was connected to a local dance school. And I had a real um, passion for working with 
uh, working with different groups of people. I've done some work with Blue Apple, um, working with uh, people who you wouldn't traditionally think of when you think of dance. You, just, you think of, um, I don't know, pe people who uh, move lots. And I, I was really interested in working with groups of people who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, would potentially find it harder to access. You know, mm -hmm. that could be due to affordability, it could be due to accessibility, it could be to do with just a whole range of spectrums of things that makes dance feel in inaccessible. And so I was really passionate about trying to create um, a place where where, people, where those groups of people can come and, 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 if, and experience the benefits of dance, which we all know are incredible. So, um, so yeah, so I kind of ran with it and um, we've now registered as a charity. We've got three main projects that we run. So we run a project for young people, uh, primarily from lower income backgrounds, which was the first project that was set up. And then after that, we've set up a project for over 65s. So um, we are running uh, community sessions for over, over 65s. And then uh, the most recent project was a wheelchair dance project. So um, all, most of our sessions are all run within Winchester, although we do now have an online wheelchair dance session, which uh, developed out of the back of COVID. Uh, again, it was, uh, we'd always presumed in person because that was how I knew dance to be delivered on, in person. And then COVID happened and it went online and, and the feedback we got was, this is so much more accessible for us because we don't have to worry about parking and leaving the house. And so we actually kept that running. Um, and then we've done we've we've collaborated collaborated a lot with local um, uh, community organisations, um, the other BCSEs, and with our lo local social prescribers. Um, so I was part of a um, a training program that was uh, put through by the National Academy for Social Prescribing, um, getting sort of communi uh, community organisations set up, ready to receive re referrals from GP surgeries into arts-based projects to help with um, uh, mental well-being. So we've had, we've been uh, working with um, working with them to try and get more people more people into the arts and um, yeah and getting men and enjoying all the benefits. So. Ooh. Hi, my name is Ellie. I work for Hampshire County Council. I have the pleasure of going to one of Amanda's classes, the over 65 Gems class yesterday. And I'm hoping I'm gonna get regular invites to go back because it's amazing. And just the impact that those classes are having on those individuals is really special and should be really proud. Um, so my role is as course prevention and physical activity coordinator for Hampshire County Council. Big fact disclaimer, I work in the public health team, but I am not public health trained. And some of the things that Norma was saying earlier really resonated with me. My background is arts marketing, um, with particular passion for dance and into arts and health, um, which is why I said, you know so many places here, which is lovely. Um, but quick background on falls in Hampshire, um, one in three over 65s will have at least one fall every year. And that number goes up to one in two at over 80 in a year. Uh, we are predicting about 91,000 people just in Hampshire will have a fall this year. So it's a huge issue. Um, in 2020 to 2021, emergency admissions into Hampshire for falls for 65 plus was 6,360. We know that being physically active is really, really important, but a lot of people forget that strength and balance are really key components and they decline, sadly, as we get over 40. Um, and after that first fall, we often see real deconditioning of the muscles and strength and also a massive loss in confidence. People tend to stay in, they're too frightened to go out, and it just, that issue just then gets bigger and bigger. So for Hampshire County Council, we run a steady and strong um, physical exercise programme. Uh, it's delivered by a cohort of freelance instructors. Um, we've got two evidence-based falls prevention programmes. The first is um, FAME, which is falls management exercise, and that's delivered by postural stability instructors. They tend to come from a kind of clinical background, 
And then the other is Otago, which is, um, sorry, I've got the like, a real flustered, nervous, <laughs> <laughs> calm down, but we're talking a million miles an hour. Um, sorry, Otago, which was um, created and evaluated in New Zealand, a place called Otago. Um, and that's typically delivered by uh, physical exercise instructors who are level two. So in Hampshire, we've got 73-ish trained instructors working across the county delivering over 90 classes, most of those in person, with a couple of nine um, every week. Most of those are delivered in community settings, art centres, community halls, village halls, um, and also leisure centres. Um, my role um, is really about supporting those instructors. Um, we provide grants for the training, community practice and marketing support. There are massive challenges. Um, Firstly, that the NHS, the sort of falls prevention provision tends to be right at the end when someone's already had a fall um, and the NICE guideline, guidelines, it doesn't really sit anywhere within that. So there's real, real issues across the system. And there's actually only 12 um, NHS balance classes running across the entire county at the moment. So ideally the progression would be someone has a fall, they would go through that 12 week programme which is actually only delivering half of the 50 hour recommended dose of physical ex activity, and then they would move into a community class. So we've got lots of challenges. <laughs> um, at the moment, we are looking at that programme and how we can expand it. Um, and very excitingly for me, we are expanding into dance. Um, the main reasons for this is to broaden the offer across the county, but also to look at the continuum of force prevention so the, the participant requirements for someone to come into a steady and strong dance class will be higher than um, a standard steady and strong class. So they'll need to be able to do things like make a 180 degree turn on their own and be really stable. It will also increase the number of classes that we have, the breadth of offer, and we're quite confident that adding dance into that mix is something that can be a real goal for someone. They might start off in an exercise programme but really want to get moving and start dancing. Mm -hmm. um, so back in 2019, um, sooner at the point in East Lead, Hampshire County Council, we're involved in a test pilot, and we've got Gabrielle here, who is teaching Steady and Strong Dance at the moment. Um, that programme is still running, but hasn't yet been um, officially evaluated in terms of the falls prevention element. So we've commissioned um, through the council later life training to deliver a new cohort of dance instructors, um, and also apply to the National Institute of Health Research um, so we are now working with the first live team, so that's the Public Health Institute research team um, and we've got two academics with a full prevention background from the University of Nottingham working with us. So we're currently looking at all of those things that Norma mentioned, that logic model, working through how we're going to evaluate it, how the programme can be rep replicable, ugh, I can't say that word, replicable, um, but also looking at those real, like those wider things. So. Does it reduce social isolation? Does it increase um, health and well-being in general? Um, what is the instructor viability for running that, that programme? And does the adding dance into that programme mix, does that reduce or increase health inequalities in terms of who might access that as participants? So it's a really exciting time. We're really happy to have um, Noelle and Kathy on the programme with us. And it's great to be here. I'm getting very nostalgic from my, my dance background. <laughs> charity called Rosetta Life. We began in 1997 and delivering dance and storytelling in palliative care um, and created a network of 20 hospices that were supporting digital storytelling, dance and um, performance. When in 20 
in 2007, I began to think, actually, and this is relevant because I think we've talked a lot about advocacy, and we began to think, if we've got this wide network, why aren't we delivering public health performances as part of public health campaigns around death and dying? So we brought hospices together to create dance theatre performances across Scotland, the West Midlands, and London. And we held an annual residency for six years at the National Theatre Studio, exploring dance theatre as part of public health. Um, that was really, really significant. And I think in the way that these cycles go, and the troughs and waves of, of the way arts and health funding evolves, I think that the Dying Matters campaign between 2007 and 2012 was really significant and quite a trailblazer for delivering advocacy. And we were able to benefit from that through, and we, we delivered dance and health performances with paediatric um, palliative care, children's hospices using wheelchair football as a movement practice with adult, six adult hospices, um, bereaved children, and it was a way of enabling public performance to really generate quite profound and lasting conversations. And I think we're at that moment now, you know, the creative health agenda is at a tipping point, and there's a moment where we can begin that campaign for social movement. Social movement campaign says, this is, this is what we need, and we need to re-own the language of creative health and take it away from social prescribing where it has, um, where we have allowed the medical model to dominate our thinking and re-own it and repossess it as a creative pathway. One where we bring people together to make and create, whether that's on hospital wards or in communities. That making process cannot be prescribed